and so, uh, and I am, I work at a company here in Birmingham called Heart Rhythm Clinical and Research Solutions. I'm also a researcher um, with ISKI and work with Dr. Lanzi. And then I'm also do some research at uh, the Birmingham VA. So that's where I come from. My background is in behavior science and health behavior. So that's why it's pretty easy for me to get like into the weeds of this kind of stuff, but I'm going to try and not do that as much unless anybody has specific questions about anything. So, and let me know if something happens and like I stop making sound. Okay, so here's my disclosures and information about where some of these projects have been funded through that um, I'll use as like, some of the examples of how I've used uh, CIFR. So this is just an outline of uh, what I'll cover, kind of the background, um, why I personally have used CIFR and some of the things that I think are uh you know, useful about it. Um, I'll go over the original framework, then the update, um, the outcomes addendum briefly, and then um, go over some examples of how I've used it in my work. So um, to start, I'll briefly review a small part of the lecture that I think was covered um, earlier, maybe last year, I know Dr. Harold gives his theories, models, and frameworks presentation. I forget which month that was given in, but um, just to review. So a framework is a structure or system of descriptive categories. Uh, frameworks do not provide explanations. They describe phenomena by fitting them into sets of categories. So the use of a framework helps systematically organize, collect, analyze, and interpret data um, the Consolidated Framework for Implementation Research, which is, you know, abbreviated CIFR. So I'm going to say CIFR from now on, because that's a lot of words, um, uh, is a framework. Um, and that's what we're going to be discussing. Um, and so it helps us explore and identify factors that influence implementation outcomes. Um, and we frequently see those referred to as uh, barriers and facilitators and, you know, labeled like that very frequently. And so determinant frameworks help answer questions like why will an intervention work in a specific setting and what, if any, factors are moderating implementation success. And so determinant frameworks help us understand context for implementation. Um, and I refer to context probably like a hundred times during uh, this presentation. So I wanted to make sure that it was defined. Um, and so those are the circumstances and characteristics of the people, places, and things involved in the implementation effort. Um, and it's important that we take context into account so that we aren't implementing in the dark, essentially. So knowing the climate and all of the other potential factors influencing implementation allows us to identify appropriate strategies that um, address any major implementation barriers and increase the speed and likelihood that research makes, makes it into practice. And so, you know, the CIFR does just that. And so the team that originally conceptualized CIFR sought to consolidate uh, a bunch of different major determinant constructs into one kind of meta framework, which they detail in this paper. Um, and this is an old screenshot of this. And I saw that recently that it's been cited over 10,000 times. And so um, CIFR is essentially a large review of theories, models, and frameworks across disciplines, distilling them down into one usable compendium of different domains and constructs influencing implementation. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I already said, so the framework consists of five major domains and constructs. Well, the original framework did, and then the update consists of five major domains, the constructs and kind of the naming of them change a little bit. Um, so using these domains and constructs within them, uh, you can have a standardized language that we can use around describing the different contexts for implementation. 
So before we get into the constructs of the framework, um, like I said, I would briefly touch on why I have used uh, this CIFR in my work. Um, and as I mentioned, mentioned, you know, it includes a lot of constructs, which really helps um, you make sure that you're looking at context from multiple angles and capturing all of the necessary barriers and facilitators that you need to design implementation strategies. Um, as I also mentioned, there's a lot of tools related to the framework that make um, using it pretty straightforward. And I'll mention a bunch of those different tools throughout the presentation. And last, as I mentioned, it's been cited, you know, over 10,000 times. So there's tons of evidence out there um, on how to apply it and, you know, different models for how you can use the framework. And so that's incredibly useful, too. So now getting into the five major domains of the consolidated framework, again, this right here represents the original paper that was published. It was just recently updated in 2022, but um, still five domains. Um, so the five domains uh, were originally intervention characteristics, characteristics of individuals involved, inner setting, outer setting and processes. And I'm just gonna touch on these briefly like right now because I'll go through like the CIFR 2.0 update and really get into the different constructs that currently exist in uh, CIFR. So here's the graphic from the original 2009 paper explaining um, the framework and showing the different um, domains and how they interact together, inner setting, outer setting, the intervention, individuals involved, and then the implementation processes. So in 2022, the authors of the original framework published an update. Um, and so what they did was they did a, you know, a large review of the studies that had used the framework um, to identify how it was being used, how it had been ad adapted or added to. Um, they also surveyed uh, the authors that, you know, had cited CIFR to get feedback on improving the framework and its constructs. Um, and they've had like several papers come out of that project, uh, one of which is the outcomes addendum, which I cover in just a few slides. Um, but first, they made some overarching recommendations about how to use the framework. Uh, they talk about how they improved the consistency across con constructs with the update. Um, they really kind of stress the importance of um, defining your domain. So when you say characteristics of individuals or the individuals involved, you're defining who those people are. You're defining what the inner setting is. You're defining what the outer setting is. So um, making sure that you're defining uh you know, these domains when you're using this framework is very important. Um, so for example, uh, when you apply the framework to your specific implementation initiative, you should define, you know, the specific innovation like buprenorphine, uh, for example. Um, so I'd say the largest overarching change though that they made in the framework from kind of that original five domains to the new five domains with the new constructs was they really kind of reorganized where they put um, people that are involved in implementation and really tried to make an effort uh, to center more around humans um, and specifically those that are recipients of the innovation. Um, and they really made an effort to differentiate between innovation deliverers and recipients throughout um, all of the domains uh, as those two groups often require different strategies for implementation. Um, there's much more specific and amplified language around including patients' perspectives and their needs, um, which was relatively minor in the original model. Um, and we often see is uh, kind of overlooked in implementation research, or at least some of the older implementation research. I feel like that's becoming less of a problem, but. Yeah, so you'll see that, um, you know, people receiving the innovation are definitely more highlighted in the update of the framework. 
So um, to review the updated changes, I'm going to kind of show you the old domains and then get into the new do domains. Um, some of them I'll define. Others um, I won't. But, you know, if you have a question about something specific, let me know. I also, um, if you go to the CIFR 2.0 paper, there's a supplementary file that's a wonderful like compendium of like every single domain and its definition. Uh, it's pretty extensive. So uh, that can supplement that too. Um, so I'll start with characteristics of individuals involved. So this was the original, um, what the original kind of construct looked like. Um, now the construct is referred to as just individuals <clears throat> and refers to the individuals most likely to influence or have authority over implementation and those who deliver and receive the intervention. Um, so you can see they updated the domains to focus on two kind of major constructs, roles and then characteristics. Um, so for roles, they took all of the constructs related to roles that kind of list uh, existed in some of those other CIFR domains and moved it all here to individuals. So you see now in this domain, you can assess the extent to which any of these individuals, um, like high level leaders, innovation recipients, um, implementation leads are part of the implementation effort, identify those people, define those people. <clears throat> It helps you, you know, understand all of the roles that are applicable to the implementation initiative. Um, and then you can also see, again, like I mentioned, innovation deliverers and recipients um, uh, differentiated here too. So then they also added this like characteristics construct. Um, and before, you know, let's see if I go back. They had, um, you know, knowledge and belief, self-efficacy, stage of change. Well, now they've updated it to, um, to include constructs um, from the COMB framework. And so now it's theory-based. And so that includes um, individuals' capability, opportunities, and motivation to implement um, the innovation. So then the next uh, domain from the old uh, framework was intervention characteristics, which is now um, <clears throat> called innovation. Um, this is one of the domains, I think of all of them, you see the least change in from like the older framework to the new one, um, but it's defined as the thing that's being implemented. So the innovation is the thing that's being implemented. Um, and you can see that they just really added innovation um, in front of a lot of uh, the older constructs to make it more specific um, to, you know, innovation relative advantage. Again, just improving the clarity of the constructs. Um, so here we're looking at the thing that you're implementing and stakeholders' perceptions of it. So what are their perception of the evidence base behind the intervention? Is it sufficient? Is the intervention easy to test out and make changes to? Or is it super rigid and complex? Is it expensive? Is it easy to access? Those are the types of things that you know, you're assessing at this domain. Okay, so then the next one is the inner setting domain. And so this was the original kind of outline from the 2009 paper. And so this is the um, updated inner setting domain, um, which covers like where implementation is going to occur, where the intervention is going to be delivered. Um, and so you can see how they now differentiate between characteristics that are specific to the organization and then characteristics that are specific to the implementation initiative. And again, as you can see, you know, they really didn't do that prior. Now here they break it down to, you know, what is this, what exists outside of the implementation effort and then what is specific to the implementation effort. So in the factors specific to the inner setting regarding implementation, um, they re uh, refine the structural characteristics construct based on, feed on the feedback. Um, and it includes physical infrastructure, work infrastructure, and the infrastructure necessary to um, implement the innovation. 
uh, they took networks and communication and made it two separate constructs, which are relational connections and communications. Um, they got a lot more specific with culture and have broken it down into recipient centeredness, delivered, uh, deliverer centeredness, learning centeredness, and so on. So um, for the factors that are specific to the implementation effort, we see some of the old constructs like tension for change and relative priority, but they added um, incentive systems specific to the implementation effort. Um, there's also a refined goals and feedback section now uh, that includes mission alignment, which is defined as the extent to which the implementation of the innovation is in line with the overarching purpose or goals of the organization. Um, and then you can see they also break down available resources specific to the implementation effort, like funding, space, and material. So these are all the uh, constructs that um, you know, they, they say you should assess at the inner setting. Okay, so then the next uh, construct is the outer setting. Here is um, the old kind of construct, <clears throat> what they looked like. And you can see that oops, it changed quite a bit. Um, but if you've used the framework before, um, you know that it was pretty broad. Um, and, you know, you can see there, those constructs are pretty broad. Um, and so uh, now they've made it a lot more specific. And so the outer setting refers to the setting in which the inner setting exists. And so, uh, you know, no surprise here, given the time that this was published, they added a construct called critical incidents, which would include, uh, you know, like many of our recent implementation efforts, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so then we also see that they've added additional constructs to improve uh, the patient and person centeredness of the framework. Um, you know, uh, again, so partnerships and connections. Um, so instead of having a single patient needs, like, section in the outer setting, they've embedded um, constructs as we went through in the like individual category. So that was something patient needs was in the outer setting originally, and now that's focused on the individuals. <clears throat> so uh, they've added socio-ecological characteristics like local attitudes and local conditions to capture economic, cultural, and political systems that may be barriers um, to implementation efforts. Sorry, I'm making sure I'm not missing. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Cortez, for the commentary. I'll read it. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, so then you'll see that they updated some of the old constructs with new language. So, cosmopolitanism is no longer there. And that was updated to partnerships and connections. Um, so external policies and incentives, um, Dr. Cortez, as you know, we pay a lot of attention to in some of our work, um, is now a little bit more specific uh, with uh, policies and laws, and then they break down different external pressures. Um, and then they also added uh, a construct on financing. And so these are kind of things outside of the organization um, that influence implementation. And so then the final domain in the framework is um, implementation processes, which, uh, so it was originally called processes, now it's called implementation processes. Again, um, they really just kind of expanded on that. Um, so the first construct is assessing, which refers to assessing needs of deliverers and recipients, as well as assessing context, which, you know, we kind of discussed as the overarching goal of CIFR. Um, Then they also added teaming, which is um, something I've personally seen in my work and was happy to see them add. And so, you know, the extent to which um, people are joining together and collaborating on implementation related tasks. Um, they added two constructs to planning, um, which include strategies and setting goals uh, or tailoring strategies. 
Um, they also updated the engaging domain and removed um, all of the, that list of people, again, that were in there, moved that to the individual's do uh, domain. Um, and so now this is just engaging deliverers um, and recipients in the innovation. So um, just being very specific to those people versus implementation leaders, which were previously listed in this, um, in this category. So they improved the definition of reflecting and evaluating to be specific to reflecting and evaluating on implementation versus innovation outcomes, <clears throat> which I'll talk about in just a second. But yeah, so you can see um, this is the fifth, uh, the fifth construct of the CIFR and or the fifth domain of the CIFR and then the constructs that are associated with it. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned, the second kind of part of uh, the like CIFR update um, was that they created um, a CIFR outcomes addendum, which outlines outcomes that can be used with the CIFR and specifically what types of implementation outcomes are driven by determinants like those that are outlined, like all of those different, um, all of those different constructs we just went over. <clears throat> so they also differentiate between uh, CIFR implementation determinants, which, which are focused on implementation context versus innovation determinants. So like characteristics of patients that moderate the impact of you know, an intervention. Um, and then they further specify the difference between innovation outcomes and then CIFR based implementation outcomes. So, um, yeah, looking at the difference in implementation versus innovation outcomes. So they really break down all the different types of outcomes and determinants one might see in an implementation research project. And so here's <clears throat> a table from CIFRguide.org that outlines um, and defines the different types of outcomes from the papers. Um, you can see they differentiate between anticipated implementation outcomes and actual implementation outcomes within that implementation outcome section. They also uh, define a category of antecedent assessments, which are um, used to predict, predict anticipated um, implementation outcomes. So uh, they, they are used to measure determinants, essentially. And so one of the, um, you know, and I, and, and I mentioned this very briefly because uh, at, with the update of CIFR 2.0, um, the ERIC matching tool is kind of outdated and I believe there are teams that are updating um, the tool. So I don't know how great or how useful it is right now, but um, you know, CIFR has a, a quite a bit of resources one of which is that um, there's been this compilation of implementation strategies that have been developed <clears throat> with them. And then um, there was this effort to ask, you know, survey experts to find out what their recommendations were, um, which kind of which implementation strategies from this compendium, you know, matched to the different CIFR domains, and like to help best overcome barriers that, you know, you find at that domain. And I'm, I apologize, I'm very much butchering this project specifically, but the purpose of it is to help you kind of identify barriers and then look at strategies that potentially are a very good fit to overcoming that barrier. And um, there was an existing tool that you could use um, if you had used the CIFR to kind of organize your data. And so um, that's one thing that I have personally used before, um, but I meant to put this slide before that. So CIFRguide.org is uh, again under construction, but uh, one of you know, the reasons I had used it so for, you know, CIFR so frequently is because there are so many resources, um, lots of different uh, resources for um, qualitative research, like a qualitative interview guide. So you can choose, again, this is the old framework, but you can choose the um, different constructs that you wanna cover um, in, your in your implementation interviews. 
and um, you can tailor them to your specific implementation effort and kind of use that to assess these different constructs using qualitative interviews. Um, they also have a code book that's on here. And so there's lots of different resources associated with CIFR. Um, and so I'm not 100% sure on what the like updated tools are gonna look like, but previously, you know, there have been a lot of really great tools available to using it for both qualitative and kind of quantitative purposes. <laughs> There's also this CERC instrument repository. So as far as measures associated with the consolidated framework, um, you do have to be a member of CERC to get access to this, but they have gone and mapped out all, uh, well, not all of them, but they've mapped out the C for domains and then have started to uh, develop these compendiums for each of the domains and matching them to measures that are assess assessing those different constructs. So that's a really interesting resource associated with the consolidated framework. Oh yeah, so again, there's lots of different compendiums, um, you know, available and different reviews and different measures that people have developed associated with different constructs related to CIFR. And so let's see, yeah, so just briefly, um, cause I do wanna address what everyone's talking about in the chat. Um, just gonna talk very briefly about some examples from mine and Dr. Cortez and April who's here's work. Uh, of how we have applied um, the consolidated framework for implementation research and the related tools. So uh, I worked on the options project with some of my collaborators that are here. Um, so we worked on, yeah, so we were part of the options project, which was part of a multi-site study called Conduit um, that was aiming to improve adoption of practices related to um, addressing opioid use disorder, uh, using implementation facilitation as our implementation strategy. Um, our study focused specifically on improving access to opioid use medications for opioid use disorder um, in the inpatient hospital setting. So um, we started out by specifying the innovations and behaviors we were specifically trying to target um, uh, and then we used a very short and modified version of the CIFR interview guide to understand barriers and facilitators to these practices across stakeholders um, at the hospital we were working at. Um, and so from there, we used a rapid approach using the CIFR code book to kind of review um, our interview summaries. Um, we did, you know, and so we used the C for codebook so that we could categorize different barriers we wanted to tackle. <clears throat> Again, we also used that C for Eric matching tool as an idea, kind of generating activity. Um, and then we went th through this very iterative process of identifying strategies and getting feedback on them and refining them. But again, you know, using the consolidated framework, here's an example of our codebook, allowed us to really kind of as a team identify barriers and kind of label them the same and then start to identify different strategies that matched each of those. And so these are just some of the examples of how we took that narrative text and assigned it to see for constructs. So <clears throat> for example, you'll see, you know, available resources with something, the priority access to knowledge and information, um, implementation climate, all of, uh, all of these were identified as CIFR constructs that uh, were you know, associated with some of the barriers that we found. And so this is just an example of the CIFR ERIC matching tool. So again, we had coded all of our data to be associated with the different CIFR um, constructs. And so where we found barriers, we put in the matching tool and it gave us, you know, some recommendations for implementation strategies. And so then here you can just see an example of how we went from identifying a barrier. So lack of awareness from available consultations, um, which matched to an ERIC recommendation of develop and distribute 
educational materials. And so we tailored that locally by, uh, you know, that recommend, uh, recommended strategy by developing a consult guide card that was posted throughout the hospital. Um, and again, these are just some examples of how we went from uh, taking those interviews, assigning them, you know, CFER constructs that match the barriers, match them to an ERIC recommended strategy, and then tailored it to our specific project. And so then one last, <clears throat> you know, example of how I've applied the CFER. Um, so here I wanted to develop an assessment of readiness to adopt best practices for treating co-occurring chronic pain and opioid use disorder. My thought uh, behind this was to design strategies to overcome barriers um, and assessing those barriers pre and post implementation, you know, strategy deployment would be helpful. So I, you know, developed this tool to kind of both understand context for implementation, but also wanted it to act as an evaluation tool for implementation strategies. Um, so to develop the tool, I used that CFER interview guide uh, to interview primary care clinicians. Um, then I used the code book to kind of analyze the qualitative data and develop a set of quantitative items to assess different factors influencing the uptake of a set of best practices. So uh, after administering the um, items that we developed to 500 primary care clinicians, we used exploratory factor analysis to reduce the number of items and identify psychometrically sound scales uh, that were assessing these uh, different domains. And so you can see that all the domains that we ended up uh, selecting, you know, at, for scales can be tied back to the CFER because I use those interviews to kind of design the um, items. Um, so if I were to des design a strategy that was targeted to, you know, clinicians' motivation to treat, I now have a valid scale to assess whether uh, my strategy has any impact on clinicians' motivations to treat this population. Um, and so, you know, if you want to tie it back to this, like the CFER outcomes addendum, this would be, I guess I would consider it an antecedent assessment because uh, we're assessing kind of predictors of adoption um, and, you know, determinants of implementation and not necessarily an implementation outcome here. So yeah, this is, um, you know, in summary, there was the original CFER framework that was kind of developed to combine all of these very important and frequently used constructs and implementation research into one framework. The CFER 2.0 kind of, you know, saw over 10 years people using the framework. They gathered up a lot of feedback and improved on it based on, you know, all of these people using it. And so that's kind of what we just went through. Um, and, you know, they did have a whole bunch of different tools to use CFER. I'm hoping that some of them are going to be updated. I see that you've commented on that, Larry. Um, yeah, because, you know, that was one of the really great things about the framework, or at least in my opinion, was just the availability of different tools that were just kind of there. You didn't have to, like, create your own code book. You could start from somewhere. So hoping some of that's going to be updated. I do know that, like, I was looking at the CFER 2.0 paper, um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, um, that if you go to the like supp supplementary file, there's like a really great um, download of all of the constructs, all of the domains, all of their definitions. That would probably be a really good starting point for like a code book if you wanted to, you know, do some qualitative work using the consolidated framework but they haven't you know, updated all of the existing tools to cover these new constructs. So yeah, that's CFER. Now I'm gonna try and read these comments and talk about that. Let's see. Oh, this is the little document. That's that's a really cool document, Dr. Barley. Yes, this is not my document. This is the supplementary document from the CFER 2.0 paper. But 
as you can see, it defines all of the different constructs and all of the different um, domains. And so again, if you are in, approaching on a uh, you know project where you may be thinking about using you know the CIFR qualitatively, this would probably be you know helpful in developing like a code book or or something. Yeah, well, then, sorry I'm late, or I was late joining. This is later, yeah. by the way. No problem. Thank you for joining. And I feel like some of y'all just heard me talk about a lot of this. So, that was great. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, you mentioned the tools, um, which is, you know, I think you and I have talked about this before. One of the great advantages of CIFR is the fact that these tools have kind of grown over time to support its use. And I'll say that I gravitate almost instinct, you know, just kind of naturally towards CIFR because oh, it's a lot easier to get data collection activities underway and other things because those tools exist. But as you mentioned, it's going to take a little bit of time for the tools to kind of catch up, I think, or to be developed to match 2.0, which understandable. Um, I guess I wonder, just a question for you. Uh, the the in my experience, both personal experience and working with others, most people tend to use like the interview guide that's available on the CIFR wiki and kind of that's the tool most people kind of gravitate towards. Have you used any of the kind of survey questions that have, I think, slowly been developed over over the last few years and it, it doesn't seem like they're comprehensive i think the one i'm thinking of for instance focuses primarily on like the inner setting but just just kind of curious whether you've used those and what your experience has been with success in using those um so i haven't had an opportunity to use them yet i have like a few items not whole scales or anything on some stuff that i have developing um, so no, I haven't had to, an opportunity to use those. I do know that like under innovate, like the innovation category, like if you look at like the CERC instrument repository, they map, you know, like the feasibility and acceptability scales, like to the innovation domain. So I know a lot of people here have used those before. Um, so that's certainly one of those antecedent assessments and I like yeah but um no I haven't you know I, there's that one I think that I had in there as an example the like inner setting I, I haven't had an opportunity to use that yet yeah I I've I think I tried on one project and the it, it was a small project so there's only so much I could probably learn from it but um one of the pieces of feedback we received from one of the participants that is, is just, it was really long. I mean, that, that has been my impression as well, looking at them. It's, uh, it's, and that was just for mostly, I think the inner setting, because as you know, they break down the inner setting into a bunch of other sub constructs. So if you're going to think about more globally, thinking about the different CIFR domains that that survey be, gets, gets to become just incredibly lengthy and I, I worry about response rates kind of bottoming out as a result but oh yeah I think it'd be hard to create something um that was comprehensive measuring you know but I think again depending on what you know about your setting you kind of can maybe have an idea of some of those places that and and what you're focusing on if you have an idea of what your implementation strategies are Maybe that can guide you to select a few meaningful ones. Yeah, yeah, good point. Do we have any other questions? There are things in the chat. I was look monitoring them a little bit. But... Yeah, I mean, I might. Can I comment a little bit on some comments in the chat? Mm -hmm. um, first of all, I think that it'd be really interesting to hear Mustafa talk about merging or conflict situations where inner and outer emerge, I suspect, I believe I have some examples in my experience, but I'm curious what Mustafa had in mind.
hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, uh, actually, I'm trying to do my uh, research in something related to the barrier and the facilitator for community engagement for uh, dinghy control, something like that uh, in Yemen context. And as, as I think all the people know that uh, the conflict situation are totally different. And when I'm trying to uh, develop my uh, data collection tool from the silver framework, I found it is a little bit difficult to see how is the outer setting is different from the inner city. Because everything in the conflict situation is affecting due to the outer city. So whatever is the question in the inner setting, most probably the answer will be related to the outer setting, either by direct or indirect way. That's my thought. I don't know if I'm right or wrong. Maybe you will help me with that. Thanks. I mean, I definitely think that so and, and you know, I could see how there could be some blurred lines between inner and outer, you know, outer setting, uh, depending on the specific context. Um, but, you know, I think it sounds like in what you're explaining, it's potentially that, you know, the outer setting is, you know, influencing the inner setting. And so it's, you know, and I'm sorry, because again, I come from like a health behavior background. So I always talk in like model language. And I'm so I'm like, if you're thinking about the social ecological framework and like you've got the kind of community and then there's these like broader societal things that influence the community, um, there's likely something at, you know, larger at hand outside of the inner setting that you're studying that's influencing it. But, you know, and if you read, you know, some of the, uh, if you read like the C for 2.0 paper, I think they talk about certain, you know, places where sometimes things can be both. Is it, can I comment as well? Yeah. Maybe this is a little bit different. And so what occurs to me is that there's two extremes, maybe. One is that if you're in a war zone, Everything going on inside is responsive to the external war. I'm thinking of those hospitals in Gaza where it, it could be that there still are inner setting properties that matter, but the outer setting is reverberating through everything management does, every allocation of supplies is somehow a reflection of that outer setting. And it may be extremely hard to be sure which one you're seeing if they say we have no bandages or we have no morphine, it is sort of outer setting, but it's, you know, maybe there's still an inner setting. I don't know. The other example that comes to mind is a little different where there's a powerful external influence or an external setting, but still a, a, a clear difference because of inner setting. And that's the opioid crisis affecting Veterans Administration hospitals. So there's powerful uh, incentives from the Congress of the United States and from public perceptions that caused VA hospitals to want to show instantly that they were making massive reductions in prescribing. At the same time, VA hospitals did not all do this the same way. And some VA hospitals uh, did it more aggressively and some did it less so. And presumably there's reasons for that that are really tied to inner setting, even though they all had massive external pressure. So I think a war zone really makes this the hardest situation. Yeah, I think, you know, just to add to what Stohan just mentioned, and I think um, there are maybe ways to get at this, but you know, these determinants that CIFR um, identifies um, doesn't always sort of weight them in a way that allows you to sort of appreciate, you know, in, in the example that you're talking about, it may be that 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 outer setting, those conflicts that we're talking about are really sort of the major drivers of some of these things. They may indirectly affect inner setting kinds of uh, determinants, but um, the ability to sort of um, sort of assess these things and weight them uh, 
um, when you're then thinking about implementation strategies, I don't know that we have a good way of doing that. In fact, I think um, you know one of the weaknesses of the C for Eric matching tool is just that. It, it kind of puts all of the determinants on equal footing. Basically, they're all given equal weight and kind of then determines or tries to identify these implementation strategies. So um, yeah, so I think that's something to consider when you're trying to apply uh, C for. The other thing I think I was gonna mention is that, uh, and I don't know if this helps you make the distinction and separate out these inner outer settings, but um, because I do think they intersect and can possibly determinants can even belong to maybe multiple domains, which makes it messy and uh, challenging. But in my opinion, CIFR is very, very sort of organizational centric. In fact, if you look at where it was developed and who were some of the original authors, they were there were people that were very much in sort of thinking about how organizations um, implement evidence-based interventions. And when you move it outside of the organizational settings, I think it's not as always easy to apply C for there are situations where the fit isn't quite as good, in which case there are other determinate frameworks that should at least be considered, I think. I agree. I should also know that while I do like CIFR and use it, I think there there's a lot of tools also available out there that, and I know you kind of discussed this, there are appropriate and, you know, based on your research question, theories, models, and frameworks that may work better. Yeah. That's why the... There are a lot of them out there, right? It gives you some choice, gives you options. I do really love it as a tool for a needs assessment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that it, it is this like large compendium. There is all these tools that you can use. Again, it doesn't, you don't have to draft everything from the beginning when you use it. So I, yeah. My work has primarily been at the VA where uh, CIFR comes from. So that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions, comments? Yeah, I do like, you know, just want to point out that Donnie's uh, you know, comment is important. And I think that might be something that you cover in, you know, your, when you talk about, you know, the differences in theories, models, and frameworks. And, you know, CIFR is just that it is a compendium of uh, ideas and there is no explanation on how they relate to each other. So that's definitely a limitation of it. Yeah, just out of curiosity, and this is a question for everybody, but you, Allison and Stefan and um, maybe Donnie, since we started, you started this conversation, but I find that frameworks like CIFR, Paris, you know, some of these others, particularly determinate ones, you want to, if you want to put REAM in that category as an evaluation framework, it work really well in the context of a, of a grant proposal because, you know, they're fairly simple to, to, to sort of describe there are these different domains and define them. You can do it briefly. Um, some of them are just getting almost name brand recognition. So you just sort of mention C for most people can kind of know what it is. Um, the use of theories in grant proposals, on the other hand, seems to be far harder, in my opinion. They kind of get squeezed out because we gravitate towards these frameworks and, um, you know, in my opinion, theories are especially helpful for unpacking the mechanisms and generating hypotheses that we are likely are trying to test in these studies. They're, they're, they're sort of the difference between front stage and backstage. You know, backstage, we have a working hypothesis of what this is going to look like and why it, this intervention may work or why this implementation strategy may work. But 
we seldom have room in a proposal to fully develop those ideas. So I feel like that is one reason why in some ways theories thus far have not received the attention that they probably need in the implementation science literature, just because the way funding is set up in a sense, and it really, I think, um, favors some of the frameworks more so than the ability to fully embrace theory, theory development, theory testing as it applies to some of these implementation science questions. I agree. You know, there's that whole kind of uh, initiative around mechanisms um, and implementation. And, but I just think that, again, it's easy to use this framework as somewhat of a, you know, understanding context, using it to design your implementation strategies. But uh, to start testing mechanisms of implementation strategies, you have to have like a pretty, I guess, interesting funder. <laughs> you know, I, I like who funds. I know there there are people funding it, but I you don't see that as much as people funding you testing and imp implementing something, right? Yep. Yep. Donnie, question. Um, just adding to this, um, I don't feel camera ready today, so I'm going to stay off camera, but um, I, my experience has been that, I mean, CIFR just kind of seems to be the default that people fall back on, and they, a lot of people seem to be using it if they're newer to implementation science because it's what's used um, across a lot of different studies and not necessarily because it makes the most sense for what they're doing. Um, and when I think, when you think about practical research, I mean, depending on what you're doing, if you're kind of beyond the needs assessment stage, CIFR is, it's huge um, to the point where I don't think it's always feasible to use um, fully as a framework uh, in implementation science, because there's so many different domains. And I see people trying to capture all the domains and doing it and then see, saying like, oh my God, this participant burden, it's like a two hour survey by the time people are getting done with it um, to try and assess all this. So I think that the benefit of, if you can get the funding of moving towards theories is it gives you a little bit of a more narrow focus. Um, and CIFR, I mean, I think I can see CIFR being used for practical like implementation practice as well, like over years for phases, but when you're doing it in a, a very limited um, research setting, it doesn't always make sense. So. I, I I think I have an unpopular opinion of being lukewarm on CIFR um, some of the time, but uh, I think there are benefits to it if you know exactly how you want to use it. Um, but it it sh it shouldn't just be the kitchen sink approach, which I think is is often how it's used in currently for folks, especially new to implementation science. Yeah, I think those are some valid points, Donnie. And I I I mean I would agree. And that's why I have had used it very frequently <laughs> because uh, it's there, there's examples and, you know, but yes, it is very, yeah, it's easy to use. And so I think I would agree in that. Yeah, I do see a lot of people who are getting into it, using it because it's just so easy to use. Hopefully, you know, there are, I, there are a lot of theories um, it'll be interesting to see as evidence grows behind them. And then maybe there's less of the testing the mechanism and more so testing other relate, you know, testing broader relationships and then the gateway framework. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> yeah. So it'll be interesting to see how theory grows, because I think that it is important to uh, really understand like implementation processes, right? So how, how do you, how are, how are implementation strategies really working? But, and you're not gonna get that with CIFR, but it will help you with your needs assessment. <laughs> exactly. All right. Any other questions? I know we're getting close to the end of the session, but we might have time for one more question if anyone has one burning question. Well, not seeing anything on online or in the chat here. So um, yeah, given that, I think we can go ahead and um, close out for the 
the afternoon. I want to thank Dr. Varley again for the fantastic presentation. I especially, I love the material related to 2.0. It's, it's a part of it that I haven't quite um, fully uh, wrapped my head around how to, you know, how to incorporate some of that just because I'm not sure I've fully um, taken the time to appreciate all the differences and how that might affect some of the tools and stuff. So thank you, Allison, very much again for giving this wonderful talk. And thank you for everyone who joined us uh, in the virtual Zoom room. Um, we will uh, be in touch with more information about the next seminar. And um, for those of you who might have any consultations coming up, we look forward to seeing you in a, another Zoom room um, in the not so distant future. So hope everyone has a good afternoon. Thanks. Right. Bye, everyone.